Okay, so um, going to be talking about line again. Uh, talking about the work that's going into version two, uh, why it works that way, and how you can make the most out of it. Um, and also a bit about where we're going in the future. So, so uh, actually before we dive in, if I could get a show of hands, uh, who's using uh, version two of Line again? Uh, wow, okay, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, great, so little history here. Um, Linegan was created in 2009, and it was sort of born out of the uh, frustration and uh, lessons learned from using Maven for a closure project for uh, six months and kind of distilled the issues we ran into and turned that into, uh, into Linegan. So um, I spoke on it at the first conj. Uh, about a year after it had been going, and then at the last conj, um, spoke with the maintainers of the Clojure Cake build tool, uh, and kind of joined forces with them for uh, working on Line Again 2. So, um, version 2 has been like about a year in, pro uh, in progress. We've had lots of contributors, uh, lots of momentum, uh, 100, 152 people contributing, so really, really proud of how that's come about. <coughs> uh, getting over a cold, so you have to forgive me. Um, yeah, so uh, Lining in 2 uh, has been a, a chance to kind of reevaluate uh, some of the decisions uh, made in Lining in 1 and revisit uh, a lot of the assumptions. So um, probably the the most basic, uh, probably the most basic thing is that uh, we're focusing that uh, the, the mistake that we made with Lining in One was uh, actually calling it a build tool, and uh, that's <sighs> sorry. Oof. Getting over this cold's really getting to me. <laughs> Um, so right with Linegan one, we we had this problem that it was it was, it was always framed as uh, a build tool, and uh, that brought along a lot of assumptions and uh, baggage with it. Uh, so this brings to mind uh, the notion of the rectification of names. Uh, so in Confucius Analects, he says, if language is not correct, then what is said is not what is meant. If what is said is not what is meant, then what must be done remains undone. If this remains undone, morals and arts will deteriorate. Justice goes astray, and the people will stand about in helpless confusion. Hence, there must be no arbitrariness about what is said. So, the uh, it really matters what you what you call it and how you how you frame the problem. So, um, this notion of being a build, build tool, you know, it brings along preconceived notions. It it kind of puts you in in this this rut of thinking like, oh well, it should work the same way Maven does or the same way Rake does or whatever. So, um, readdress. Uh, Stepping back from that allows us to um, think about addressing the problems unique to closure rather than just blindly following. Uh, so, lining into we've uh, we've taken the focus on project automation rather than uh, build tool. So, obviously that means that it operates on projects, and that's uh, that's pretty key. Uh, you know, you can use it outside the context of a project, but that's not the the um, what it's designed for, uh, and this notion of automation means that um, it's uh, you know it's designed to encode actions and be able to get repeatable results out of them. So um, it's not designed to support the use case of just you know throwing stuff together and making it happen. And of course you you can do that, but that's that's really counter to the design. Uh, so the primary way in which the notion of a build tool uh, became a problem was that um, the, the uh, um, version one was designed strictly for development time only. Uh, so this notion of being a build tool was kind of tightly coupled with the notion of being used for development. So we, the thought was that at some point, Clojure would include a command line launcher of its own and that 
you know, we, we just didn't want to go there, but uh, that didn't pan out. Uh, so we added this line run task. So, you know, you can, you can just kick off uh, your dash main function or whatever from line again. So this made it somewhat suitable for production use, but um, it turns out that, that we had a lot of assumptions built in about, um, about development. So things like the tests were always on the class path and you had development time tools that didn't make sense to be loaded in a production situation. So uh, for Langan 1, we included this line no dev flag, which you could enable to, uh, to switch that stuff off, but it, it was really tacked on and it, it didn't have a cohesive, uh, cohesive design to it. It was just uh, you know, trying to undo some of that. So in, in Langan 2, every, um, that kind of stuff is expressed in terms of profiles, and we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, in a minute, but um, yeah. So um, some of the other problems that we're addressing uh, from Linegan 1, uh, this notion of uh, isolation between the project and the Linegan itself. Uh, in Linegan 1, you would have plugins and uh, certain other directories bleed through uh, to affect both Linegan's class path and the project's class path. And it turns out, um, especially with plugins, um, the fact that there's two separate uh, dependency resolution times, there's like plugin install time and then runtime, uh, means that you can't actually cohesively uh, perform you know, deduplicate uh, the dependencies, and that leads to a number of really hard to debug problems. So um, that's no longer the case in Landing in 2. Um, and then Landing in 1 had a really, really half hearted REPL implementation because uh, basically everyone who was working on it was using Slime. Uh, and so, you know, it included a REPL out of the box, but it was really pretty lame. Uh, just this socket, uh, socket REPL thing with. Uh, uh, with the command line client. So in version two, uh, the REPL is based off uh, Chess MRX and REPL project. Um, so this is kind of like a, become the de facto standard in the Clojure community, um, this and REPL stack. Okay. So uh, it means that the tooling can be shared across uh, all, uh, all clients. So everyone is, rather than having a separate uh, REPL server for like Emacs and Vim and what have you, um, the idea is to just converge on this single unified implementation. Uh, so it's, it's, you can take advantage of shared infrastructure and uh, stop uh, reinventing the wheel. And uh, in addition to that, the REPL client that it ships with is uh, much improved. Uh, Colin Jones reply is, uh, offers a lot of great completion and documentation functionality. So yeah, that's a big improvement over Landigan 1. Uh, and then the other problem is just that in Landigan 1, snapshots get included by default, and uh, there's a number of problems with that. Uh, slows down dependency resolution, and it can lead to unexpected behavior with uh, version ranges. Uh, so we're looking at moving away from that in Landigan 2, and I'll cover that more <coughs> later. So. I'd like to talk about kind of the big picture conceptual overview of Lanigan. Um, so one of the things that you know you've probably come to appreciate living in Closure Land is this notion of you know X as data. Uh, everything, if it can be expressed in terms of just simple maps and functions, then it is, and uh, this just leads to great level of clarity and uh, obviousness. So, um, one of the obviously one of the central uh, central idioms in Langan is the the project and the project map. So um, this is just uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so if you look at the the def project macro, uh, say you're you're checking out a project and you want to get started on hacking it. Uh, 
you see this here. Um, and the, uh, the idea is this, uh, this turns into a map that Linegan can operate on. Um, and so I mentioned you know, uh, everything as data, and obviously the, um, the def project macro is a, is a macro, and so it's not, it's not just a map, but um, it's a pretty straightforward uh, transformation to turn it into a map. Um, the, the def project macro exists because uh, it would kind of be, it would be infeasible to include, or infeasible or annoying to uh, include everything like this. Uh, you'd, you'd have to end up putting in a lot of repetitive defaults and uh, you'd also have to quote all your symbols for dependency, uh, dependency names. So the dev project macro cleans that up a bit, but conceptually, uh, everything behind the scenes is just, uh, just a map. And uh, you can use the line pprint plugin to emit that map. So if you're ever curious about, uh, you know, you're making a change and you're wondering what the effect is gonna be on the project map, uh, you can pull that in and give it a run and get an overview of what it's going to look like. So another benefit of everything just being a map is, um, you know, certain types of manipulations are possible. So I mentioned earlier with profiles in landing into, um, you can adjust the behavior in different circumstances. Um, profile. Uh, a profile is just a, uh, another map that gets merged into the project map um, that can can change the settings. So um, this, uh, when the profile gets activated, right, there's just this this deep merge going on, um, and it's not uh, it's not a simple merge in terms of like closure core merge. It's a it's a merge that kind of honors uh, tries to to do whatever makes sense in terms of whenever there's a conflict, so like sequences will get concatenated and maps will get merged, et cetera. Um, and then you can override that behavior by attaching metadata onto, uh, onto a value if you wanna have it replaced or something like that. So, um, right, so that's, that's projects. Um, really simple data and simple manipulation of them in terms of uh, merging. And uh, the other main concept in Linegan is the task. And so if you think of, you think of projects in terms of maps, uh, think of tasks in terms of functions. Um, so uh, here you see a Linegan invocation uh, of the hello task with these, um, these arguments. And that really translates into uh, this function call. Uh, so you find the, the task function and uh, pass in the project map and then pass in the, um, the XYZ uh, command line arguments. So every task invocation can just be <coughs> thought of as, as, a, as a function call. And uh, when you are so the goal here with your with your tasks is to uh, is to achieve referential transparency with these function calls. Um, so if you think of the the arguments to this task like abstractly as uh, the project map, the command line arguments, and the files on disk, and the quote unquote return value being the exit code, whatever gets put to standard out, and the files written to the target directory. Um, if you think in terms of of those uh, of the function that way, then um, if you can achieve referential, trans referential transparency there, then uh, you know you, you get a lot of benefits in terms of project automation, uh, repeatability, and so on. So, um, right. So uh, that's the big picture uh, of lining into the the big. <coughs> Big issues there. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the pitfalls of uh, problems people run into uh, with Lightning into. Um, so I mentioned refer referential transparency <coughs> in project functions, um, and one of the most common uh, 
blockers there is the notion of snapshots. Uh, if you think of the analogy of task being a function, then uh, a, a project that includes a snapshot uh, could be thought of as having dynamic binding uh, or taking advantage of a dynamically bound value uh, because the what this means is if you have a snapshot, that means the, the state of your remote repository is actually going to affect your project in uh, un uh, possibly unpredictable ways and you don't have 100% repeatability. Uh, so obviously snapshots are valuable sometimes, but um, it's important to realize that when you do bring them in, there's a, there's a cost you're paying in terms of determinism. Another big problem similar to snapshots is the notion of version ranges. Uh, version ranges look like a really good idea. You know, you say you test your project against version 1.2 to 1.4 of Clojure and you want to express that in your project.clj file. So um, it looks like, looks like something that really makes sense there, but unfortunately there's some really unexpected uh, semantics in version ranges where uh, the underlying library for handling dependencies with, uh, with line again treats uh, a version range as a hard dependency. And so if you put a direct dependency on, say, closure 1.4 in uh, your project and somebody else has a, a range of 1.2 to 1.3, then it's gonna, the, your version that you explicitly uh, specify is actually just gonna be ignored and uh, this other one is gonna take precedence. So um, I strongly recommend just a, avoiding them entirely. Um, so open-ended version ranges obviously have the same uh, non-determinism problems that uh, snapshots do because new versions could get published and uh, that could change the behavior of your project. But uh, even in the case of a closed, uh, a closed range where both, you know, the the upper end is specified, there's still some really un, unexpected semantics there and it's probably best to avoid. When you're um, debugging these kind of problems, uh, there's a new tool in Line Again 2 um, called Line Depths Tree that you can use and this will, uh, this will explain uh, how, why you're getting the versions that you're getting, uh, where they're getting pulled in from. So you can see here, um, you know, Commons codec is coming from ring core, and uh, if you're ever wondering why you ended up with the versions that you are, um, it can be helpful to get some visibility in there. Um, another tool in this case is uh, the line pedantic plugin you can use. Uh, this is, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the line pedantic plugin will actually completely refuse to resolve dependencies if there's any ambiguity. So if, uh, if one of your dependencies is, wants a certain version and you want a different one, um, it'll tell you that there's ambiguity and it'll just, it'll just give up. And that forces you to address the, these kind of problems, but, um, and it can kind of point out any potential, uh, potential conflicts. So um, that may en end up getting merged uh, in uh, at some point, but for now it's a plugin you can use. Um, so, um, uh, one a really common question people ask about uh, using line again is they you know they come with this this you know standalone jar file and uh, want to know how to make that work with um, with the line again project. And there's ways to make it work. Um, you can use the line local repo plugin to install jar file into your local repository. Or you can use, uh, you can deploy it to like a static HTTP based file server or an S3 bucket or something like that. But uh, it's important to realize that these are really just uh, addressing the symptoms. And the problem is really that someone's giving you a jar file and expecting you to use it that's not based out of a a real repository. Um, from an automation perspective, uh, a file that's not in a repository just might as well not even exist. So um, the thing to do there is to make a lot of noise about 
that fact. And if you've got you know a Java project that refuses to publish to a repository, you know, open a bug report or something like that because it's really not acceptable. So uh, for the final pitfall, uh, I'd like to tell a story. Um, imagine, if you will, a resourceful, nefarious attacker. And this guy wants to mess with a person or company using Clojure. So he comes to the conj. And uh, late at night, after everyone's gone to bed, he comes down to the wireless router and sticks a paperclip in it and resets it and uh, tweaks the DNS settings to uh, point to server of his choice that he controls. And uh, then he heads off. Early the, the next morning, some Clojure programmers come down to get some early morning hacking in. and. Uh, they are in for a surprise. So let me show you how this, this works. If you would like to follow along, um, you can try uh, <laughs> adding this to your Etsy hose. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, let me just show you how, how this works here. You can configure sudo to insult you when you get the password wrong. Uh, fun fact there. Um, so I'm going to go in there. I'm in, I'm, so this is simulating this attack on DNS. Um, I'm going to clear out um, my cached copy of Clojure 1.4. Uh, and then. Oh, goodness. Yes. Uh, So, yeah, I'm going to clear out, clear out my cached copy there. I'm going to run line new um, hello. Just uh, get a new project in there. And uh, once I uh, launch a REPL, let's see what happens. Um, so it's going to try to fetch the closure jar from my uh, fake repository, <laughs> and boom, right? Uh, remote, uh, you know, arbitrary code execution there. So uh, the moral of the story here is that really we've got a long way to go for uh, project automation in terms of what we can really trust. Uh, so. Uh, you know, this story might seem a little far-fetched, uh, but really it's, it's interesting to think about how little there really is between, you know, your project and uh, such an attacker. Like, there's, uh, it's really, uh, people, people put a lot of trust into these tools uh, where in some cases there's really not uh, a lot of, a lot behind that. Um, and this is not unique in any way to JVM infrastructure. This is a problem. Uh, basically, any language level, you know, CPAN, Ruby Gems, things like that. Um, and the only systems that aren't subject to this problem are, you know, OS level systems like apt and yum, uh, where all the packages are uh, signed through a central authority. So, um, right. So. The solution here, in, you know, in, uh, that goes part of the way towards addressing the problem is getting signatures on your, your packages. And uh, systems like apt and yum, obviously, they've got a bit of an advantage because they do have a centralized authority. So it's much easier to, um, to handle uh, signatures for, for something like that. Uh, Maven Central does require signatures for artifacts deployed there, but um, they, there are older artifacts in there that predate that policy. And uh, even though the signatures are there, uh, they don't really get checked very often. So um, it doesn't really, doesn't really make much of a difference. So um, what I've been working on uh, in kind of parallel to 
landing in two is this notion of a releases repository in Clojar. So um, the idea is um, that you know Clojar's right now is really this uh, kind of wild west, anything goes situation. And uh, I think that was really probably pretty appropriate for the, um, the time, you know, early on in the, the evolution of the language. Uh, it's helpful to have fewer barriers to publishing, but um, uh, but um, uh, the notion that we're working on with uh, the releases repository is there would be a bit of a higher bar to getting something in there. Um, for instance, it would not include any snapshots. Uh, it would require a certain level of metadata on all jars getting in there, so you would have to declare a license and things like that. Uh, but then also you would have to have signatures for all the all the artifacts deployed there. So um, that I think is uh, necessary, but not sufficient for addressing this problem. Uh, it's kind of the the building blocks on which uh, a good solution can be can be constructed. So once you have signed deposit, signed dependencies. Um, you can actually run through uh, your dependency graph and you know you can check, uh, verify them. So I'll show you here. Um, there's this uh, experimental feature in lining into line depths uh, verify that will run through your uh, dependency graph and it'll tell you what the, the signature state of each um, of each dependency is. So ideally, um, if <clears throat> uh, ideally uh, in a scenario where you know you're getting all your dependencies from the new Clojars repository, you'd you'd be able to get a full list of uh, you know fully uh, fully signed dependency tree. Um, but you know that's that's really not the solution in and of itself. Um, all that a signature tells you is that you know, it was signed by somebody with a given key, and that doesn't tell you about whether the, that key is trustworthy in any way. So, um, right, I mentioned the apt and yum uh, signatures. Uh, you know, they've got a centralized authority to say, you know, these keys are trustworthy because this person is a Debian developer or whatever. Uh, and in a decentralized setting, it's much more difficult. Uh, you have to build out what's called a web of trust. So um, I'm hoping that this is something the, the community can work towards um, and that you can actually build uh, this transitive notion of trust between you and the authors of the libraries you use uh, by having the, the various keys uh, be signed and by having people sign. Uh, so uh, right, use, with the GPG, you express the fact that you trust a key by signing that key and um, you can build out this, this web by following the, the links of the signatures between yourself and the, the author of a library. And so it's my hope that eventually uh, in line again, we'll be able to not only verify what's signed and not, but what's trusted and not. So, so um, my hope is the new Clojure's repository will um, will encourage this. Um, so, we've we've got that uh, still in development. But if you publish repositories, uh, if you publish libraries to Clojure's with Langan, you version two, you'll notice that it automatically signs it. And uh, so now you can actually go into Clojars and uh, through the web interface, you can add your public key there. And uh, then soon once we get the, the promotion working, uh, there will be tasks to upload uh, from the existing repository into the, the releases repository for qualified jars where uh, the signature checks out and the metadata uh, is all there. So, um, right, so I think 
the closure community is kind of in a unique situation here in that, um, you know, we're still a fairly small community where you can have, you know, like the majority of closure library authors actually in one room here. And, uh, but we are also building on this existing infrastructure where all the, <coughs> all the, all the infrastructure for signatures actually already exists and is not really terribly difficult to, uh, to build on. So even though, uh, no, uh, even though no other decentralized web of trust system has been able to pull it off, I think we actually might have a chance of, of building out that, uh, that level of trust and uh, using signatures. And so um, let's take a look at how this works. Um, oh, yeah, I missed that, sorry. <laughs> Slides out of order. Um, so, if you have GPG installed, um, you can generate a key there. Um, I, the defaults are typically pretty good, apart from um, I recommend having it having a expiry date in there, and then um, you can publish that key to a centralized key server so other people can pull it in. And right, like I said, Linegan will sign artifacts upon deploy, but it can also use your key to encrypt your credentials. So your Clojar's password doesn't have to be in plain text on disk, which is uh, you know, probably a good idea. Um, but uh, so like I said, uh, I think the Clojar community has an opportunity to build out this web of trust if you, um, I think actually now would be a perfect time to do that. So um, why don't you go ahead and if you don't have a GPG key installed, generate one. Uh, if you have GPG and you don't have a key, generate one. And, uh, and we can actually do some of this verification right here, right now. So um, right, if you, um, if you go ahead and just generate your key or pull your key up and uh, you can verify the identity of just the person sitting next to you and we can you know, take the first step towards uh, towards building out this web of trust. So, um, right, um, when you're building out, uh, when you when you're signing someone's key, it's uh, you know it's important to verify their identity. So this is not something you can do online. This is something like you have to do face to face in person. <coughs> um, so you can you can you know check to make sure they're who they say they are. Um, so. Uh, right, once you've got your key generated, um, look to the, the person next to you and uh, verify their identity using um, you know, driver's license or so on and so forth. Um, and then um, you can, if they've published it, you can, you can call uh, receive keys to pull it in and uh, check the fingerprint and confirm that it matches uh, what they're showing, and then you can sign it, and uh, and then send the signed key back to the the server, and the server will um, will record the fact that this person is uh, someone that you trust. So, um, yeah, if you ever uh, the uh, so like the Debian community, they have these these uh, key signing parties that um, are really kind of an important part of. Uh, Building out that trust, but I think that's something that we could uh, we could learn from and uh, and work towards. So, um, yeah. Um, so right, the long term goal is to be able to build a uh, a system that you have good reasons to trust that you can like verify and uh, that's resistant to attacks. And I think uh, this is. Feasible, um, and you know the the first steps here are clear, but it's gonna you know it's gonna take some work to build up the necessary connections, and uh, make the you know get community involvement to make it happen. So, in closing, group hug. Uh, <laughs> let's do this. Um, um, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs>